Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing our study of 101 verses that prove the doctrine of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. So uh, right now uh, we're going to pick up where we left off on our list. Uh, before, Oh, by the way, if you have not seen the previous videos, uh, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. And they're on a playlist titled 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. So I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Um, this is probably, I think, the fourth or fifth video we put up now. And it's uh, probably it's probably going to take us 20 or 30 or 40 videos <laughs> to get through this whole list. Uh, so, But with me, uh, working on this uh, project together, uh, is Brother Jason Jack. So I, I hope uh, if you're not already subscribing to his channel, you will subscribe to it. And he has some great content on that. He's a, a great defender of the, uh, the true gospel. So, brother, uh, say hi to everybody, and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Ready to go here on Memorial Day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right now we're on uh, John 5.24. In the KJV, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. All right, brother. As usual, I'm, I'm going to always put you on the spot to teach us first. And All right. Well, this is a great passage. This is one of my favorite passages. It not only shows that it is by faith in Jesus Christ that we obtain eternal life, but that we obtain eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ in the present. Uh, it's a spiritual rebirth that happens at that moment in time of trusting in his finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. And that not only that, but it further defines what everlasting life means. Everlasting life means everlasting. It means eternal. Um, that those who put their faith in Jesus Christ shall not come into condemnation. So if you could come into condemnation after receiving eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, then this verse is not true. And we know that every verse in the Word of God is true and pure and eternal. Uh, and so therefore, eternal life means eternal life. So this is a very good uh, passage that teaches eternal security in Christ. Your past from death to life, as it says uh, at the end of the passage. And that's a spiritual, uh, that's passing from a spiritual death to spiritual life. Uh, you know, the next verse says, Barely, barely, I thank you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. That's talking about the spiritually dead. Those that heard, you know, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, you know, the kingdom of God, and he is the kingdom of God, that he was spreading the ministry of who he was, that he was God manifest in the flesh, and that those that believed on him that were spiritually dead and didn't in their sin, there's no more condemnation from them. And if they hear and believe, they shall live. And that life is everlasting. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, very good. I, I agree with everything you just said. And uh, I will add this, that uh, the, the purpose of this study is to point out that um, we have we have a list of 101 verses uh, uh, to make the point. But uh, there's, if we wanted to, we could make this list larger and have at least two or three hundred or four hundred verses that make the same point. And that is that the doctrine uh, uh, that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone without any religious works required on our part uh, is what we're proving here. And, and so each of these verses, we, we we're looking at it, does it say any works are required? Uh, th this verse uh is, uh, does not say that you've got to repent of your sins. It doesn't say that you've got to follow uh, the, the laws of Moses. It doesn't say you've got to be water baptized. It doesn't say you've got to do anything except it says, uh, believeth. 
So, uh, as a matter of fact, in the, in the, the Gospel of John, which uh, is uh, this verse comes from the, the Gospel of John, um, it's noteworthy that that book, uh, near the end of the, the book, John writes that the, the reason he wrote that Gospel was to teach us how to get saved. That is the sole, sole purpose of the book, uh, or I should say the primary purpose of the book. Um, so I've often said, if someone wants to know how to get saved, you should go read the Gospel of John and read it over and over again, 10 times or 100 times, before you're ready to go look at anything else in the Bible, get very ensconced in that book, because uh, it, it's important to recognize that the word believe uh, in some form appears in the Gospel of John 99 times in the King KJV translation, uh, and, and the word uh, repent uh, does not appear one time in the Gospel of John. So um, it's not only what is included in a verse that uh, we learn uh, from, it, it's also what is not in the verse. So, uh, by the way, another thing I'll say about this verse is that, <clears throat> um, see, I, I'm looking at a parallel uh, Bible translation. I have the KJV on one side, and right alongside it, I have the Amplified translation. And then in the Amplified, they give us the uh, uh, the red letter um, 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 printing. Uh, the, the red letters. Um, it, it's very common for Bible publishers to take the words that came right out of Jesus's mouth and we don't print them in black as uh, black ink but red ink. So a lot of people, uh, I, I've talked about this in numerous videos in the past uh, about the these extreme factions of people uh, that, that some people say the only thing that uh, we should pay attention to and is relevant to us uh, as Christians are the red letters, the words that came out of Jesus's mouth. And so you don't listen to Paul or Peter or anybody else, just Jesus's own words. And that's an extreme position that is, uh, you know, um, horribly wrong. Uh, but then you have another faction on the opposite end of the spectrum, and they say the only words that matter are the words that Paul wrote, and he's the apostle to the Gentiles and to, for the church, and, and that's all that we should be paying attention to for salvation. The other words of uh, Jesus' words, uh, John, Peter, uh, anything else apart from Paul's words, um, are not relevant to us uh, for salvation. So these are two far extremes uh, on both ends of the spectrum. And the truth of the matter is that Jesus, John, Peter, and Paul all taught the same thing, that all you've got to do to get saved is believe on Jesus for your salvation. They all talked about believing as the sole requirement. They all talked about the death, burial, and resurrection as the uh, means that Jesus was able to accomplish this for us. Uh, so... Uh, uh, but the point I'm making is, I think it's important to recognize that this verse is a red letter verse. This is what Jesus says. So, would, would, could we say that if more was required than simply believing, as it says here, it says, verily, verily, and that's a way of saying, you know, I'm really emphasizing this, pay close attention to what I'm saying, this is really, really important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Now, he only says believeth as a requirement. If anything else were required, repenting of sins or getting water baptized or following commandments, then we would have to conclude that Jesus was negligent because he, he didn't include these other requirements and, and he was a false teacher. Um, all right, so that's enough. Uh, that's what I want to emphasize on that. Uh, anything else uh, you want to respond to anything I just said? Yeah, I think that, again, uh, John 5, 24, this is a great verse, a, a great verse for soul winning to teach that it's by belief and belief alone and not of works. And, you know, people that believe in a worst state salvation whether they straight out say it's by grace or faith plus work, or if they say it's by faith alone, but then you have to prove that you believe by your work and sort of backload the gospel with a worst state salvation, they end 
up, they can't just go to this passage, for instance, in John 5, 24, and just take the word of Jesus as truth and believe what it says. And what they'll end up doing is copying and pasting their own gospel. They'll take John 5, 24, but then they'll take, for instance, I came out of a Pentecostal church, they'll take Acts 2, 38, put it with John 5, 24, and start building their own man-made gospel, their false gospel, by copying and pasting different verses to make different ways of salvation, to, to make this step-like plan where you have to do five, six, seven things or more to go to heaven. And if you don't, then you're not saved. Well, again, they're not taking the Word of God at face value, what it says. They're not trusting in John 5.24. We can take John 5.24 alone and understand that it's by faith in Jesus Christ, it's by believing in Him, by hearing the gospel, the word of our salvation, believing that, and then through faith, you no longer have condemnation, and you are passed from a spiritual death to a spiritual life. You're spiritually reborn at that point in time. Um, so that's that's what I was just making emphasis, you know, these very clear passages. If you show to a worst based salvation, they want to add something to it. And it's usually their righteousness and twisting other scriptures out of context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I want to uh, just um, uh, confirm and, and repeat what you emphasize in your opening remarks on this verse, uh, because it's, it's very important to understand exactly what each one of these uh, phrases really means. Um, uh, he that heareth my word and believeth on him. So when you hear the gospel and you believe uh, the gospel, uh, believing on him, uh, that's, I think that's believing like the John 3.16 uh, point that was um, earlier in the in the, the book of John, and that is that for God so loved the world, so we believe that God, the Father, loved the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So this would be kind of supporting that point that if you believe on the Father and believe that he, that uh, He did what I said earlier in chapter three, that uh, he, he sent the Son to provide this everlasting life for you, then, uh, so keeping that in context, so uh, it, it says, you hath everlasting life. Now that's present tense, you currently have it, and since it's everlasting, uh, then that means that uh, it can never change, it lasts forever, so you, that, that's an eternal security statement there. Um, and shall not come into combination, that's a promise that you never be condemned, that you don't have to worry about that, uh, so that's another um, uh, confirmation of eternal security that once we have this everlasting life, we're not going to ever regress and go backwards into a state of condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So that means that you've already been pa uh, passed from death to life. It's, it's done. So you're, even though you're not bodily resurrected yet, um, uh, your status uh, is, is settled that you have eternal life. And... Now, I'll read it in the Amplified here and then get your final thoughts on this. It says, I assure you, I most solemnly say to you, the person who hears my word, the one who heeds my message, and believes and trusts in him who sent me, has, possesses now eternal life. That is, eternal life actually begins, the, the believer is transformed and does not come into judgment and condemnation, but has passed over from death into life. Okay, any, any final thoughts on this before we go, we go to the next verse? No, that, that amplifies it very well. Okay. All right, so now let's go to the next verse, and it's Romans 9, verses 31 and 32. Okay. Um, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, 
because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Okay, brother. Well, this is Paul speaking to physical Israel. Uh, first of all, in, as you read the book of Romans, um, he distinguishes physical Israel from spiritual Israel. And he does this on numerous occasions. But here he's speaking about physical Israel and discussing that they are establishing their own works of righteousness as it continues after the end of Romans 9 and uh, uh, Romans 10, verses 1 through 4. I think we talked about Romans 10, 3 on a previous video. Um, that, you know, they, they didn't want to um, believe on Jesus Christ by faith, you know, obtaining his righteousness for salvation but they wanted to continue in their own righteousness, following man's doctrine, following the works of the law. The law, again, for physical Israel who had never put their faith in Jesus Christ, they stumbled at the stumbling block. That was Jesus Christ. Um, you know, they, the, the chief cornerstone, um, you know, the rock of offense, as it says in verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in sign a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So we know that the on him is Jesus Christ, uh, and that those who believe shall not be ashamed, as it says in Romans 10, um, as, as we see later on in, in uh, the book of Romans. So again, they're trying to establish their own righteousness by following the, the law, the deed, which no one can fulfill perfectly, which no one can do perfectly. Um, but the law was never intended for anybody to keep it perfectly. It was to show that they couldn't keep it and that they couldn't attain, attain salvation by their own works of righteousness, that they needed a Savior, and that was Jesus Christ, and that is who... Um, they needed to put their faith in, but they didn't seek it by faith, and, and therefore they stumbled. Uh, you know, when when that revelation of Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he is God manifest in the flesh. He is the one that was prophesied that was going to overcome death for them and show them in the flesh to the one true God, the true God of Israel, who he was, but they they rejected him. They they stumbled when that was presented to them. Um, and why did they stumble? Because they didn't accept him as their Messiah, as their Savior, their Deliverer, their Redeemer, by faith, by trusting him, by believing the great I am, believing that he was who he said he was. And therefore, they went back to the law that could never save them and tried to do it themselves. Um, but it didn't work out then, and it doesn't work out now. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, um, Romans chapter 9 um is kind of a, I believe, a parenthesis chapter. Uh, leading up to it, it, it Paul is, is laying out this problem that man's sin, a sinner, and, and uh, that's the problem. And, and uh, as he goes along through Romans, he teach, teaches us that Jesus is the, the remedy to, to the problem. Um, but chapter 9, uh, see, this is, the, this is the chapter that Calvinism is based upon because they don't under, understand Romans chapter 9. And because they got that wrong, uh, and they conclude that this is uh, talking about um, um, that uh, the elect, the people who are um, uh, chosen by God to be saved, uh, and, and, and that God does the, the choosing, he, and, and he, man has no voice in the matter, no free will to, to choose to be saved or not. They get all this from from Romans 9 because they're misapplying it to in the church uh, to the church regarding salvation 
I mean, the whole chapter is really about God having the sovereign ability to decide which of these characters that are referenced in chapter 9, which of these characters he's going to use to carry the seed uh, of the Messiah. Um, and that's really, but I have a, a playlist called Calvinism Debunked. And, and I, I have a, a series of videos going into great detail on Romans chapter 9. So anybody... Um, who is interested in that, you go to that playlist and, and really get this whole chapter explained uh, uh, very, very completely. That's not the purpose of this study here today, but I, I hope everybody will, because uh, the Calvinists, because they don't understand chapter 9 correctly, they, now they form a false doctrine, and then what do they have to do? To support the doctrine, they have to redefine all kinds of words in the rest of the Bible, like whosoever doesn't mean whosoever, all doesn't mean all, world doesn't mean world. Uh, they have to redefine all these things that, that are clearly showing that their doctrine is false, but uh, because their conclusion in Romans chapter 9, uh, they have to uh, change the Bible, the meaning of the words, to support that false doctrine. Uh, now, the other thing... Uh, uh, I, I think it's important to understand here when this talks about, you mentioned that the law, uh, that it doesn't work following the law and never has. And that's a very important thing for people to understand too. Uh, if we go, if we start reading the Bible from Mount Sinai, when Moses gets the, the law given to him, to Israel, uh, and then uh, for that point forward, uh, if you, I'd like everybody to just search in the scriptures and get back to me. If you can find any point where it says that the law's purpose is to earn eternal life and go to heaven. There is no, there, there is no statement in the Old Testament scriptures that ever says obeying the, the those laws, it, it, the purpose is to go to heaven. It, it says the purpose is to be blessed. If they follow the laws, you're going to, your life will be blessed. The population of Israel would be blessed, but it's, that's not the means of it. But the problem is, they started applying those laws as a uh, as a uh, works system to earn salvation, and it was never intended for that purpose. Um, um, the The purpose is, if you do the right things in your life, uh, just just the uh, the principle of reaping and sowing. If you treat people right, they're going to be nice to you. If you're honest. You're not going to go to jail for, uh, you know, embezzlement, for example, you know. So it's just a question of um, when you when you do the right things in life, your, your life's going to be blessed. If you do the wrong things, you end up, you know, uh, with all kinds of problems from sin. Uh, so that's really the purpose of the, these laws. And when we don't do the right thing, if we try to apply, use those laws as a means of salvation, then it teaches us that wait a second, no one can follow that perfectly. So don't don't eat, don't even dream that this is the means of salvation. You can't work your way to heaven by following laws because you can't do it perfectly. No one can. So in that way, the law serves the purpose of being a schoolmaster to teach us the the impossibility of earning salvation. Um, so um, I guess. Anything else? Uh, I didn't talk that much specifically about all the details in this verse. Is there anything else we need to say about this? That would be, I think those uh, those other points were important to uh, to clarify uh, because there's yeah, so. Just... Go ahead. Yeah, just to further clarify that, you know, it's, you know, it's not just the points of Calvinism and read Romans. You're never going to understand Romans. Uh, because you're going to, like you said, you're going to misinterpret chapter 9, um, Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. Calvinism doesn't understand that Jesus is the one predestinated, that he was the firstborn, that he was the one called, uh, and that we are foreknown by God through Jesus Christ, once we are in Christ, then we are the elect, because we are in Christ, who is the elect, who is the predestinated. So it's not that, you know, God predestinates each individual soul, he predestinated his son and conformed um, to be the image of the son, 
and the firstborn among many brethren. And if you're in Christ, you are in the elect. And that's how, you know, so a lot of people will, will misunderstand the election. And another point is dispensational teaching, you know, that will teach that the Jews are still God's chosen people, that they are the elect, and some verses mean this, some mean that. But again, if you, and it just shows that false doctrine leads to more false doctrine. Um, and, you know, if you are a hyper dispensationalist, you're not going to understand the book of Romans. You're, you're going to, you're going to misinterpret, you're going to twist stuff, you're going to have to talk some of the stuff out because it won't make sense in the context of the false doctrine that you're trying to learn or understand or teach. Um, you know, but Paul clearly states several times, you know, getting back to Romans 9, like Romans 9, 6, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And, you know, he just hammers the point that the physical Jews, the ones that are saying they're the seed of Abraham, they're not spiritual Israel unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a difference. Um, you know, and, and he goes all the way back to the beginning of, of Romans for that, you know, discussing, um, you know, at the end of Romans 2, for instance, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, that he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, a circumcision that is of a heart and spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not a man, but of God. So he's reinforcing this, that it's not by the works of the law, it's not your ethnicity or, or anything else. God's not a respecter of person, that it's through faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So yeah, that um, those types of teachings, if you adhere to those tenets, those false doctrines, you're not going to understand the Book of Romans at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll read the uh, two verses in the Amplified. And whereas Israel, uh, though always pursuing the law of righteousness, did not succeed in fulfilling the law, and why not? Because it was not by faith that they pursued it but as though it were by works, relying on the merit of their works instead of their faith. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ. All right, I think that's pretty clear now. Shall we go on to the next one? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this is Acts 4, verse 12. Okay, neither is there salvation in, in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. All right, brother. Uh, this has always been one of my favorite verses. What do you say about it? Yeah, this is one of my two top verses when I began a discussion that it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ, you know, uh, the name above all names, and point that there's salvation in none other. Uh, there's no other way. There's not a way for Christians to accept Jesus, and that's their pathway to salvation, but in another country, someone that may call upon the name of Allah, that that's their way of salvation. Well, if you trust the Bible and believe the Bible, then John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12, John 3, 36, 1 John 2, 21, 22, 23, you, you could go on and on about how it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. He is the one true God in eternal life. That's, that's 1 John 5, 20. So I guess whoever is making this list you know, like we talked about the other day, we just talked about the stumbling block. And so if you read Acts 411, just before this verse, you know, it says, This is the stone which was set and not of these builders, which has become the head of the corner. Obviously talking about Jesus Christ, um, which it mentions by name, who he mentions by name in verse 10. So we know verse 12 is speaking of Jesus Christ that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is 
none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's very plain, very clear. If we trust the Bible, we must accept that truth. And when we meet other people who have put their trust in false gods, false religions, of that, you know, things of that nature, that we need to come to them with the gospel of peace and in kindness and meekness and with understanding, preach them Christ crucified. Use these verses, not out of condemnation, but of truth, and show them the truth. And then, again, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God that they may acknowledge the truth of the gospel that you tell them with a meek spirit, with a humble spirit, um, and hopefully let the word of God, that seed, be planted in their heart so that they may acknowledge the truth. Um, and so, again, this is one of the go-to verses that, um, that I use when somebody will say, well, Jesus may be your path to salvation, but this is my path, or something of that, um, of that nature. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I made the title of this uh, series um, uh, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Um, but there's really... There, there, I, I really should say that um, faith alone is, is not enough. The, the second aspect of this is Christ alone. So your faith alone must be in Christ alone. Um, see, a person can believe that uh, the only way to go to heaven is because of faith, not by works, but their faith could, doesn't have to be in Jesus. It could be just in God uh, being there sa- saving them, just God generically or whatever. Um, but uh, so th- this verse here, and there are others that serve that purpose to say, wait a second, your your faith, you're saved not just because faith alone, without any works required, but the faith must be a specific type of faith. It's got to be in the person of Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in that person and his um, uh, his ability uh, alone to give you salvation. And his faithfulness to keep his promise, and his finished work that makes it all possible. So, um, th- in Christ alone, that's what you're believing. That uh, uh, this verse here uh, is, I guess, is a like a sister verse to uh, when Jesus said, uh, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me." Both of these verses tell us that Jesus is the sole, exclusive means of salvation. Only Jesus can save us. Buddha can't save us. Muhammad can't save us. The Pope can't save us. The Virgin Mary can't save us. And we certainly can't save ourselves through our own religious efforts either. Only Jesus can save us. He's the sole source of eternal life. Um, and so the verse, uh, I'll read it in the Amplified and then get your last thoughts on this. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. That's the Amplified.
as Christians, we need to read our Bible. We need to know these verses. We need to have them memorized where they just flow off the tip of our tongue. If we have a conversation, um, you know, at work or wherever, uh, about these type of topics. And again, you know, you want to do it humbly and with a gentle spirit, but at the same time, you want to contend for the faith. You know, you want to contend for the name of Jesus Christ. You don't want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes. So, you know, believe in not only the gospel and Jesus Christ as your Savior, but believe in its power. And that when you tell others about it, that that word, that the words of God have power, and it can convert a soul um, and pass them from spiritual death to spiritual life. And just trust that God is with you as a soul winner and, and learn these verses so that you can be a blessing to others um, and lead others to Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. All right, uh, we'll go to the next one then. Uh, and it is um, John 1, verses 12 and 13. Okay, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. There's a lot of great points in there, brother. There is, and this is a great verse. Um, The first 14 verses of John, you know, John 1, really, really touched my heart uh, several years ago, and, you know, I I get choked up just thinking back to that moment in time, when I first understood truly who God was in the person of Jesus Christ, and accepted Him as my Savior, Um, you know, I'll never forget that moment I read John 1, the first 14 verses, which includes, you know, John 12 and 13, which we're going to discuss here. Um, but I remember having read that many times. But then I read it again, and it was almost like a veil came off, and I read it for the first time uh, at that moment. And, you know, I look, looking back on it, I probably just received the Holy Spirit through faith earlier, or that was sort of a moment in time where, when that was the the Holy Spirit testifying in my spirit that I'm still insecure and understand um, who Jesus is. And, and um, you know, the reason that I was saved is because I received Him, Jesus Christ, by believing on His name. And that spiritual rebirth that I got wasn't anything that I did. It was simply through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did, his finished work on the cross and that he overcame death for me through his resurrection three days later. Uh, it wasn't the will of my flesh. It wasn't anything in my flesh or blood. Um, it wasn't my will of man that I was wanting this, but that I had free will to accept and acknowledge the word of truth. But then... That spiritual rebirth was of God. And I was spiritually reborn by a supernatural process uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, there was uh, the last verse mentioned the name of Jesus. It said, There is no other name under heaven. And then this verse also mentioned uh, to them that believe on his name. Uh, there, there's something very, very special about the name of Jesus. And uh, it, it's, it's stated so uh, ex- uh, emphatically. So isn't it worth asking, well, what does the name Jesus actually mean? Uh, it's, uh, in, in Hebrew, it is Yahshua. Um, 
And, and that literally translates Yah's God, Yeshua saves. God saves. That is the actual literal uh, translation of the name Jesus. And, and so that's the whole point is that when we believe in his name, we believe that God is the one that's saving, not man saving himself through any kind of uh, religious works or uh, working our way to heaven through our own efforts. No, we conclude that no, God has to be our savior. We have to rely on God. And this Jesus is the savior God that we need to rely upon. Uh, and so uh, the sons of God, I'd like to ask you, could you expound on that? Because uh, we know that we have, uh, you and I, we, we believe in the, the tri-unity uh, of the Godhead, the one God, and, and that God is uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yet still only one God. And we, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. So how can you and I and all of others who believe on Jesus for our salvation how is it that we become sons of God? Yeah, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, capital N. Uh, we become a Son of God, small s, through faith in the capital N, who was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's all through faith in Jesus Christ. We can't we can't do it ourselves. We can't become a son of God by our power. It is by the power of God that we become his son, small s, through faith in the son of God, Jesus Christ, uh, the only begotten of the Father. And in verse 12, how do we receive that power to become a son of God? Well, you have to receive him. You have to receive Jesus Christ. And how do you receive Jesus Christ? Well, you just look to the end of that verse, even to them that believe on his name. So you receive him by believing on his name. And as talked about in previous videos, when you see that word even in the King James Bible, it is basically to reinforce an earlier statement or the next thing or phrase, the word that comes after it is the synonym or reinforcing that previous um, that previous phrase or passage or, or word. So that's how you become a son of God. That's how you become a child of God. And, you know, like the, the Pope, for instance, will say we're all children of God. But that's not true. You become a child of God or a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you are reborn, get that spiritual rebirth into the family, the eternal family of God. Otherwise, we are a son of Adam, you know, a son of disobedience that needs a savior. And, and so, and some people use, look at sons of God and go back to Genesis 6, and that is a whole other, uh, you know, <laughs> discussion about who the sons of God are in Genesis 6. Uh, I haven't talked to you about that or anything like that, but just, you know, Briefly, my thoughts are sons of God throughout the Bible are believers. Flesh, human, human flesh believers. Uh, they're not angels. They're not um, anything else other than believers uh, in God and Jesus Christ. Hmm. All right. Um, but the we are not the begotten sons of God. See, uh, we're, we're sons of God, as you said, because of our faith, um, something happens. Uh, our faith in Jesus to be our Savior, uh, the Holy Spirit enters us. That's the baptism of the Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit indwells us and actually continues living in us, bringing our spirit to life, quickening us so we're spiritually alive and born again as a, as a child of God. That's when we become a child of God or a, a son of God. Um, I guess you'd say it's a woman, you call her a daughter of God, or a child of God was better for, applies to everybody. Um, uh, but it's all, it's, um, I don't remember where it says it, but it, it, it describes it as an adoption rather than a, a getting. Um, now, I have a, 
several series that I did last year talking about early church history. Um, we find about the first 30 years of church history given an account by of Luke in the book of Acts. And I have a verse-by-verse -verse teaching I did on the book of Acts. I hope everybody will watch. But in addition to that, I look at the first 300 years of first church history um, in my playlist titled uh, Early Church History. And then uh, uh, kind of associated with that are early church heresies and early church creeds. Uh, so those are three playlists all related to this. But the point that I mainly want to make in, the, in that uh, teaching is that it didn't take very long at all uh, after the apostles for apostasy to overwhelm the church. Uh, right at the beginning of the second century, uh, this doctrine of, of, of uh, you know, beginning uh, saved because of sacraments and, and our works uh, became very predominant. Um, it's the, the, all the church, early church creeds, they don't really deal with how to get saved. Um, uh, all the church creeds deal with is the uh, identity of the Godhead and defining it and explaining it. And in that way, I give them credit for really um, uh, uh, debating and, and trying to come up with a way to let everybody understand how to understand how can you have one God and that Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there's still one, one God. Uh, and, and so if you watch my teaching on the early church creeds, you know, that will be helpful. Um, but the, the main thing is that um, Jesus is the Son of God and that he's the same essence or substance. We are not. We're sons of God through adoption. Uh, so, uh, again, I don't want to go ahead. There's, I, I spent many hours teaching uh, on that, so I don't want to get too sidetracked on that. It would, it would require too much time. Uh, anything else before we... Oh, uh, what about the verse 13? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Any, any final words on that point? Basically, that teaches me that there's nothing that we can do in the flesh. It's not our, it's not anything that we can earn or merit. Uh, it's not any of the works of the law that we keep or do that saves us. Um, you know, if you're a good person, if, if you do this or that, that's not saving you. Um, what saves you is in verse 12, receiving Jesus Christ, believing on his name, then you receive the power to become a son of God. And as you said, being adopted uh, into the family, you know, Romans 8 talks about that, where it says, for as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, bondage again the fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, have a father. Uh, the spirit itself bears, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and as children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And it talks about that in Galatians, how that we're joint heirs with Christ. We have to be in Christ, uh, being baptized in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, and that comes through faith. Um, and not of anything that we're doing. Um, we're not, we're not spiritually born through this flesh and blood. As it says, not blood, not the will of flesh, not the will of man. Nothing on, of our flesh and blood or um, anything in this natural world is going to allow us to enter into that family. Uh, it's simply through a spiritual regeneration, through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, again, getting back to the whole purpose of this uh, series, uh, it says, even to them that believe on his name, uh, it, it's believing only is the only requirement. And then it goes on to say, uh, not the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. I'm going to read this in uh, the Amplified. See, what you and I have been doing here with all these verses is that we've been amplifying. In our own words, trying to explain uh, more about the verse. Uh, and the... Uh, now we're going to see what these amplified translators, the committee of people who worked on that translation, what, how they have amplified on it and see how, com how it compares to what we just said. Um, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right 
the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, that is, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Who are born not of blood, that's natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, uh, through physical impulse, nor the will of man, that of a natural father, but of God, that is a, a divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. You think they did okay on that one? I think so. Yeah. And that further clarifies what we're talking about in uh, the Book of Romans earlier about not all Israel is Israel, you know. And Paul further emphasizes that by looking at the seed of Abraham and the seed of promise. And the seed of promise is received by faith. You know, Abraham believed God and his faith was kind of righteousness. That was the seed of promise. It's always been through faith and not of our flesh and not of what family on this physical earth that we're born into um, are that we may be of Jewish lineage or whatever ethnicity, color, skin, gender, it doesn't matter. God's not a respecter of person. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. All right. Um, you want to try one more? We have about 10 more minutes. Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. This is Isaiah 45, verse 22. Uh, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Amen. Mm -hmm. Isaiah's prophesying of Jesus Christ right there, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I did, this is funny. I, I did a video this uh, few months ago of Isaiah 45, and I titled it, Jesus is the Lord of the Old and New Testament. And I read Isaiah 45, 17 through 25, and I won't do it here for, uh, for time's sake, but I would encourage the viewers to look at this passage in Isaiah 45, verses 17 through 25, and every time you see Lord, capital L-O-R-D, say the word Jesus, the name of Jesus in its place, to really emphasize who Isaiah was prophesying of and the attributes of God, of Jesus, um, and especially this verse that we're looking at, um, there is none else. Uh, Jesus Christ, he's the Son of God, he is God. And look unto him and be saved everywhere, all nations, to the ends of the earth. Because there's no other name. And we've already gone over uh, in John 14, 6, that's 412, uh, whereby we must be saved. So this is this is Old Testament um, prophecy, you know, 800 years or so, so before uh, God was manifesting the flesh at the birth of Jesus Christ. Teaching the same exact way, the same plan of salvation has always been the same through faith in the Redeemer. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking at uh, verse uh, uh, 21 also. I'm, this whole section of verses you referenced there, I looked at that. But I, I think that the verse 21, uh, it, it'd be helpful to see that connected to 22. So I'll read them together. It says, Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath to told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've often said that, uh, you know, I, I always refer to Jesus as our great God and Savior. Uh, to, to me, God and Savior is, is the important thing to uh, title, titles for Jesus. Uh, and uh, this verse here is, declares him, and this is referencing God, that God, uh, there is only one God, and that God is the Savior, and there's no other beside him. So, and now throughout the, the Bible, we see Jesus referenced as the Savior. So if God is the only Savior and Jesus is the Savior, 
then deductively we have to conclude that Jesus is the Savior God. Yeah, this this makes me think of the, uh, uh, the when uh, uh, Israel was being uh, bitten by the snakes, and uh, God told Moses to put a serpent on a brass pole and lift it up, and it, anybody who would look at the serpent on the pole uh, would be saved uh, from from where they would not die from the snake bites. Uh, so. Uh, that by looking on that, they would be saved from death. By looking to Jesus, we're, we're saved from the second death. Uh, and and so this is a, a, one of the pictures of Jesus uh, and his salvation. Jesus even pointed to it when he, he said that um, just as uh, Moses, uh, I'm paraphrasing this, so forgive me, am I getting exactly right? Just as Moses uh, lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And in that manner, I will draw all men unto myself. So uh, it, all they had to do was look. And see, this is the way this really relates to the study is that this doesn't, it doesn't say, um, look unto me and repent of your sins and get water baptized and change your life and surrender and follow and serve me and ye shall be saved. He says, look unto me and be ye saved. Look unto me. When you look unto him, it's just like, okay, Moses told the people, just trust what God said. If you'll just look at the serpent and, and, and have, have faith, you'll, you'll be uh, healed, then uh, it's going to happen. So they had to have faith and look to, look, believe that by looking on that uh, serpent that they would be saved from the snake bite. And, and they were. And it's in the same way, we just need to look to Jesus for our salvation. It's like calling on the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm depending on you to save me. You look to Jesus. You walk through the door. You drink the living water. All these things are just uh, illustrating how simple it is that there's no works required. It's just uh, the various ways of telling us that we need to really 
uh, go to Jesus for our salvation, rely on him. then uh, I guess that will be the last verse for today and uh, look forward to next time uh, just uh, kind of any uh, summary of your thoughts on the study Thanks again. Uh, I always enjoy these talks and look forward to the next time. To the viewers, uh, uh, I hope it's abundantly clear in every one of these videos that uh, you can have eternal life uh, in heaven guaranteed to you and, and given to you as a free gift from Jesus Christ if you just simply trust him for it. Uh, reject anyone else as the means of salvation, reject any other methods or means of salvation, uh, and just rely completely on Jesus, believing that he is your Savior God, that he died for your sins, and he raised himself from the dead, and that proved that he is our Savior God, and that he is the sole source of everlasting life. And when you believe that, you receive it. You receive the gift. So thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.